Chapter 13 Man the Mythmaker Lightning flashes across the sky, followed by a deafening boom of thunder. The ancient Germanic pagans, knowing nothing about atmospheric pressure and electricity, knowing only that there must be a hidden cause for this awesome phenomenon, declare that this is the handiwork of the god Thor with his mighty hammer, Mjolnir. I used to consider the ancient world, with its many religions and its dizzying array of gods and goddesses, as utterly backward. It was hard to imagine how the human race could fall for these wild stories so obviously created in the imaginations of men. But in this assessment I feel to recognize that these people did not possess anything remotely comparable to the knowledge we take for granted in the modern world. On closer reflection, the ancient people were doing something that was quite understandable and even progressive. They were articulating things unknown by composing labels that were based upon their current level of understanding about the universe. Here's an illustration of the probable reasoning processes that went on in the ancient world. The name Thor was selected, not because a god had spoken and identified himself, but simply because language is a tool for differentiating one thing from another. In other words, they had to call him something. Identifying the source of lightning as a god deserving of reverence is perfectly understandable, since man regularly saw himself at the mercy of forces greater than himself, forces that possessed an order suggesting an underlying intelligence. The belief in many gods is known as polytheism. Monotheism, which is what we have in Christianity, Judaism and Islam, simply chooses to identify a singular all-powerful source responsible for all phenomena, rather than outsourcing various responsibilities to a pantheon of lesser gods. Ancient cultures created elaborate myths about their gods as a means of explaining the universe. Science is commonly thought to be the means of uncovering the true reality behind faulty myths, but when we look closely, we will see that this is not quite so. Science actually brings to light a more detailed and accurate mythology. Consider how the pagans sought to explain the force behind lightning. They did not know what this was, but in order to discuss it, they had to name it. Man is a communicating creature, and if we are to communicate successfully, we must invent a matching vocabulary for ourselves. On this occasion, Thor is what rolled off the tongue. The tendency to see gods in the forces of nature is not exclusive to paganism, but is even reflected in Christianity. On the 2nd of July, 1505, Martin Luther, who would later become the founder of Protestantism, was traveling on horseback during a thunderstorm. Suddenly, a lightning bolt struck the ground close to him. Fearing the judgment of God, he cried out, Help! Saint Anna! I will become a monk! If we define the term reality as the true nature of the universe beyond all appearances, we then understand science as a means of creating a model of reality. Well, this is precisely what the ancient pagans were doing when they invented gods behind the outward appearance of the world. The difference is only that they had not developed a rigorous set of rules, what we call the scientific method, to help them separate good answers from bad ones and so their answers were highly inaccurate by today's standards. But if we're inclined to assume that the use of the scientific method puts us in a position of complete accuracy, think again. Is reality made of particles or waves? If we look at it from one angle, it's made of particles. From another, waves. It cannot be both. And yet if we didn't have two conflicting models to work with, we would make the mistake of thinking we had a complete and accurate model. We are playing essentially the same game as ancient man, modeling reality by approximation. We differ only in that we are playing with a much greater scale of detail. From our more enlightened perspective, we've seen into the belly of Thor and we know a little more about what makes him tick. At some point in recent history, we came to understand that thunder and lightning occurred due to entirely natural processes of electricity and atmospheric pressure. There was no need to see sentience in the storm. And so the pagan myth of Thor 
or the Christian myth of the monotheistic Yahweh expressing his displeasure via weather, became obsolete. In its place, we now have the myths of electricity and atmospheric pressure, and the stories of how they relate to each other. The myth of electricity? Did I really say that? Well, consider what the word electricity is. It's a label appropriate to our level of understanding, just as Thor was a label appropriate to a past level of understanding. It might be tempting to say that Thor was the myth and electricity is the reality, but it's important to note that we don't actually know what electricity is. We can describe electricity by experimenting with it, observing the results, and labeling everything we discover. Notice that we are still stuck in a pattern of observation and labeling, just like the ancient mythmakers. The difference is only that we are using a more intricate scale of detail. Ultimately, we understand that all phenomena are composed of energy, but no one really knows what energy is. If we say energy is the stuff that everything is made of, it looks like we've defined what energy is. But if the question we wanted an answer to was, what is everything made of, then the answer, energy, isn't really telling us anything. We've merely doubled back on ourselves. A good example of how science is myth in disguise is Isaac Newton's theory that planetary orbits are due to the gravitational pull of the sun. Newton was able to come up with mathematical equations relating to gravity that could predict the positions of planets with some limited accuracy. This lent credibility to his theory. Much later, it was discovered that space and time were nothing like we assumed. They were not fixed and absolute, but curved in relation to the masses of stars. In terms of our solar system, this meant that the planets were not moving in an arc around the sun, but in a straight line. Gravity was not the culprit after all, at least not in the way we had assumed. Einstein came up with his general theory of relativity, which took all this into account, and his mathematical predictions about the orbits of planets proved more accurate than Newton's. In short, Newton's theory about planetary orbits was wrong. His approximation of truth was replaced by a better approximation of truth. Put another way, Newton's myth had outlived its usefulness. Today, we have a mesmerizing amount of detail to play with, right down to molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles. And this is what causes the modern thinker to assume that he's holding the essence of reality in his hands, when he's really only holding symbols that attempt to approximate reality. Likewise, ancient myths are symbols, only not so intricate and accurate. When people assume that contemporary science represents the unshakable truth, this gives rise to the notion that we have now reached a pinnacle. We have found that which is true and thus irreplaceable. That's the very same game that religion has played for thousands of years, and it gives rise to the same old unproductive dogmatism. The claim that one has achieved objective knowledge, whether from a religious or scientific standpoint, results only in the desire to hold knowledge at a standstill against any new discovery that calls present assertions into question, resulting in the failure to carry knowledge forward to heights unexplored. This attitude describes many atheists and skeptics, who enforce contemporary science as the singular tool in forming their worldview. My personal area of interest is the clash between the scientific and the occult, specifically the effect of consciousness upon the physical world in a manner that could be described as psychic or magical. To most atheists and skeptics, such a fascination is laughable. In my experience, atheists are generally smart, rational people, but their knowledge tends to be restricted to specific disciplines that they have elevated above all others, and this unfortunately causes them to suffer a degree of tunnel vision. 3,000 years ago, nobody knew the truth about life, the universe, and everything. That much is clear from a study of history. Does living in the 21st century give me a special advantage in finding that elusive total worldview? No. Our present is just an arbitrary point on the great journey of the evolution of the universe. When I think about how much more advanced our understanding is today compared to the ancient world, I like to imagine a hypothetical 5000 AD. I picture someone flicking through the history books and saying, 
the 21st century? Oh yeah, that was when people thought everything was just molecules and atoms. How backward! Yet those future people, with their ultra-advanced knowledge, may have modern myths of their own to overcome, the likes of which we can't even imagine. When you understand that science is the modern myth unrealized, your entire focus changes from keeping that myth intact to seeking whatever holds the potential of moving the myth to a deeper level and of taking your understanding forward. The choice is whether you want to align your thinking with the mass of humanity in the present day, as most do. You can join the herd of any of the major world religions. You can even join the herd of materialistic atheism. But the track record of all past herds is that none ever possessed a true and complete worldview that stood the test of time. So there is no reason to assume that the present offers you such a gift by virtue of it being your present. It is only our collective hubris that causes us to dogmatize the present. When we become aware of that feeling, it enables us to choose a route not often taken, the path of the pioneer.